Welcome to Every Creature Ministry, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Just, Father, I ask that you would bless these words, that you would give us grace today and wisdom and understanding, that you would direct our study, you would provide for us the bread of life, and for those that come to hear, that you would give us spiritual wisdom in your scripture. Have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. I ask that you would give life to those that hear. If uh, there are any here that have not known the grace of the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So I wanted to begin here in the book of Isaiah. The main subject I wanted to start on was in beginning in chapter 64, but I wanted to build the context by beginning in ver- or chapter 61, because there is this continuing conversation that is going on through the next several chapters, and we need to find out who he's talking about, what he's talking about, how it relates, how it relates to now and the end of the world, because it's a prophecy about the end, about the final consummation of all things in creation. And I know that many pastors there are out there saying that the Old Testament is a history lesson, but as you will clearly see, God says it is not, that it is a prophecy for the end. And we begin, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, they that might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. And I wanted to just pause for a second and kind of put this into perspective, who and what he's talking about. And we begin initially with the the shock and awe there, that he has come to proclaim liberty to the captives. And this is a prophecy of Christ. When Christ began his ministry, he opened up the book of Isaiah and he read this book and he said, today is this prophecy fulfilled in your ears. And meaning that it is him. So the purpose that he has come is to proclaim liberty to the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted, the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And commonly today, men are teaching that Holiness derives from man, that all of our religious affections, they come from man, but we do know the very ministry of Jesus Christ was to bring freedom to those that are not free, to those that are captives. And this is a very carnal teaching. It's a very natural teaching, and it is very naturally understood and accepted by most of the natural and carnal professors. This idea that all of our religious works come from ourselves and are enacted by ourselves and that we are rewarded from God to be rewarded for our righteous deeds is a very, very uh, corrupt, it is an abomination, and it robs God of his glory. But for someone who has never known the miracle of God upon the heart, that God delivers from sin, that God delivers us from our own wicked desires, then they would never comprehend the scripture. Because he talks about being born again, and the new nature, and the new life, about being transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his marvelous light. It talks about regeneration, about a miracle that takes place, a very present Christ, who not just forgives us, 
for our sins, but delivers us from the power and the dominion of sin and of Satan. He sets us free. That's what he came to proclaim liberty to the captives, to those that are captive. And Jesus, it was a very critical message. When he was speaking to the Jews there and he told them, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they told him, We be Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to any man. How is it that thou say, You shall be made free? And he told them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, He that committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever. The son abideth ever. If the son Therefore shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. And this is so critical. That this is why Jesus came. This is the evidence that you have been born again, is that you have been set free. This is the rejoicing of your soul on a daily basis, that you have been made free and that you know and recognize and remember the days of old when you were a captive and knew not God and did not consider his righteousness. And this is the chief reason that he chooses the weak and not many noble, not many wise. It's important to notice it says not many. So every once in a while, some that are noble or that are wise. But for the most part, God takes the bad men of the world and he converts them and changes them. And I was thinking of Paul the other day, Saul. What a, what a miracle it was that Saul was not just a normal sinner. But in fact, he was a persecutor of the church. He was a hunter of God's children. He hunted for them. He broke through. He caused all types of ruckus, seeking to imprison them and to put them to death. He stood in all the, as the witness at Stephen's death. And these are the people of God. His mission in this life was to hunt down and to kill the church of Christ. And then... A great light shined about him, and Christ spoke to him directly and asked him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? To which he responded, Who art thou, Lord? And he told him, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Isn't it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? So God had mercy on him, and Paul said that the reason that he would have mercy on such a sinful man is that he is an example to those who afterward would look to him for mercy and for salvation. And Paul is very clear, all that is in me that you see that is good, that's what he says, all, there in my flesh dwelleth no good thing but the Spirit of Christ. So at no point does he ever take credit. Numerous times he starts his epistles, Paul, an apostle, not by the will of man, nor, you know, but of God. John 1, 12 is a very popular verse. It says, as many as received him, to them he hath given power to become the sons of God. In the modern translations, many of which are from the devil, they have corrupted this word and altered it to say, as many as accept him, he has given the right. But the very next verse. And the reason they have changed the word of God to fit their doctrine is because the doctrine, the Bible testifies against their false doctrine. So this is a false Bible to agree with false doctrine. But the next verse, it just shreds it. It shreds that whole concept because it says, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it talks about them being born again. Well, how do we know? Which were born, not of blood. And that's what he says. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. So they were born of God and not by the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So this liberty is obtained from Christ and the glory for this liberty is given to Christ because the life of I now live, as saith the Apostle, I live 
by the faith of the Son of God. So the life that is in me is one that is worked in me by God. Thus, I can take no credit whatsoever at all for anything good, not just for your salvation. You can never take credit at all for any good deed ever. The glory belongs 100% to Christ. If there is at any time you believe yourself a good man who deserves to be praised by God, you greatly err. Because God looks to the humble. God looks to the broken. That's what it said. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted. Not the righteous, not the religious, not the self-righteous, let's be clear. But the broken hearted, the captives, the prisoners. He's come with a call to them. Look unto me, all the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And for them, they are thankful. They're thankful that true religion through the Lord Jesus Christ is not what we do for Christ, not our righteousness, not our righteous deeds, not our sacrifice, not our tithes. It's about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, about His suffering, about His righteousness, about imputed righteousness. Because how have we fallen so far from what is so clearly taught in the Bible that men are justified by the righteousness of Christ being imputed to them, not their own deeds, but His sacrifice on the cross and works do come into play. As it teaches in James, if you're without works, you don't have faith. You have a false faith. If you say you have faith and you do not work righteousness, it says that you have a false faith. Because as the soul without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works. So faith working together with works. What this means is that those that believe, they do work. And we also know that they are changed. The Bible says, It is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so the glory belongs to God. It is a very critical point of his message. And because the house of God has fully rebelled against his teaching, now has the wrath of God fallen upon them. And it will only get worse. This is the history of the religious and the self-righteous. When they, Christ came, when all the prophets came to warn them of their abominations, did they repent? Well, sometimes. Now we continue in verse 4. They shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. The strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called, you shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame you have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles. And their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them. And I wanted to pause and kind of give you, because he's switched momentum here. And now he's addressing a different group and he's talking about a time of restoration, a time of blessing for the people of God. When they shall be rewarded and they shall be known as the ministers of God and the priests of the Lord, because in this world it says a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country among his own family. And yea, a man's foes will be those of his own household, saith the Lord. 
He said, See, do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth, but rather division. Division. And so here he's talking about a time of rejoicing, of being rewarded in their land where they will have an everlasting joy. That they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. And now, what he's talking about is the time of heavenly Jerusalem. And this is described as the end of the world when heavenly Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And this particular restoration, in this context, he's referring to the final consummation, the final end in which they shall be restored, that the children of God, the kings of the earth, shall walk in the light of the Lord in heaven, that righteousness shall be restored, that the land shall be healed, because it is healed from their desolations. And we do know, Jesus explains in Matthew, that the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoso reads, let him understand, is something that happens at the time of the end. It's something that happens. That's what he said. Go your way, Daniel. The words are sealed until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Those that know their God and the righteous, it says, shall understand, but none of the wicked shall understand. So the context, he's talking about the restoration after their city was left in a desolation. And he continues and confirms this. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt be also a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. And there is the word again. He repeats this sentence, this terminology, which describes the great falling away. But thou shalt be called Hezispa, and thy land Belua. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And we know that Jesus is the bridegroom. And the bride is the church of God, the people of God. So as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen upon your walls, O Jerusalem, which shall not hold their peace day or night. Yea, you that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. Give him no rest till he establish and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give thy, give thy grain to be meat for thine enemies. And the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine, for the which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it, and praise the Lord. And now bear with me, we will show you that this is referring to this time in a moment, because that's why we are building back a couple chapters before. We are now almost through 62, and now we begin to tip over into a different segment. But it says, they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates and prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway. 
Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughters of Zion, Behold, thy salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Who is this that cometh from Edom with thy garments of Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. And so I don't think anybody there can doubt that right now he's talking about the end. The context here, he's talking about a wine press, and he alone is trampling those people inside of the wine press and their blood is coming up to his clothing and this is written in the book of Revelation regarding the end and regarding those that come to make war against the Lamb there's a whole army that comes and follows their false prophets to make war against the Lamb and he tramples them in the wine press it says and their blood comes up to his girdle to his belt so here he's talking about this time why are you red in your apparel and your garments like him that treads in the wine fat? And so they're asking the Lord, why are your garments covered in blood as if someone who was standing in a wine, wine press? And he said, I have trampled the wine press alone. And of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of the redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. So all the way flat with the earth. And it's interesting because he talks about Babylon and the actually the harlot or the whore of Babylon as being a cup in the Lord's hand. That she was a cup in the Lord's hand to make all the nations drunk and to make them go apostate from the Lord. To make them turn against the Lord. So he says that she has been a cup in the Lord's hand. She has been judgment to make the earth drunken so that they wander from the right way. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. It is to sap them of all strength that they are laid flat. And I will, and this is exactly what he says in 2 Thessalonians, that it says, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And so it talks about the state of the churches at the end of time. He says, the end shall not come except there come a falling away first. And in that, that's how he ties it together. And let's continue on. I will make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And that's so reminiscent when he says we love him because he first loved us. Or not that we love God but that he loved us and gave himself for us. So in his love, in his pity, 
which coincides with mercy. And go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. So in his love, in his pity, he redeemed them. He bared them, meaning he carried them. And he carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that puts his Holy Spirit within him? That led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, divided the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, and led them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven, and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where is thy zeal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me, are they restrained? Doubtless you are our, our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledgest not, thou, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why have you made us to err from your ways and hardened our heart from your fear? Return for your servants' sake, the tribes of your inheritance, the people of your holiness have possessed it but a little while and our adversaries, they trodden down your sanctuary. So the, the sor sorrow of the, the Lord here, the prophet here, he talks of a time when the place of the Lord, where the Lord's name was set, was held by his people for a very short time. And then the enemies came in, the adversaries or the unsaved, the wolves came in, and then they trampled down the sanctuary after that time of holiness, that time where the people of your holiness possessed the land. But then he said, our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by your name. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, and when the melting fire burns, and the fire causes the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries. That the nations may tremble at thy presence, when thou didst terrible things which we looked not for. Thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he has prepared for him that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoices and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, Thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those in continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon your name that stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and has consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord. Neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech you, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. 
our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praised thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste will you refrain yourself for these things O Lord will you hold your peace and afflict us very sore and now we're in 65 I am sought by them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. And I can't understand that there is a more clear demonstration of the sovereignty of God than in these past few verses we just covered. And he's humble before him because he understands that he is the potter, he is the potter, and that we are the clay, and that as the creator, he fashions his vessels however he desires and uses them for whatever purpose he desires. And it is enough to be blessed enough to be a vessel for the Lord, to be used for righteousness rather than evil. But we must acknowledge that he is the potter, and we are the clay, that we are the work of his hand. As Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing and that it is him that is works this righteousness in us not our own righteousness and all our righteousnesses are as a filthy rag our iniquities they take us away and this powerful statement that there is none that calls upon your name that stirs up himself to take hold of you and we do know that this is something that is echoed in the book of Romans, that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. There's none that understands. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none. And it says, we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So the point of that passage is to show you there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands and seeks after God. Now, let's pause. If you think you of your own volition have decided to seek after God, you have not found God. Because he says, there is none that stirs up himself to take hold of thee. It is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God that does the work. So if you think you have stirred up yourself to do this work for yourself, he tells you you're wrong. Because no one does. Not one person ever. None. No, not one. There's none righteous. There's none that understands and seeks after God. In fact, if someone were to begin to introduce God to most people who are in their sins, they would plug their ears. They might attack them. They will do whatever they can to avoid it, not to hear it. They can't, they, even if it's forced upon them, they will refuse. Because it is grace. Because he says there's none. There's none that doeth good. There's none righteous. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are all as an unclean thing. And this is where we bring this to Christ. Do not sorrow that you are wicked or evil or that you don't know Christ take that sorrow that godly sorrow which worketh repentance and turn to Christ and plead for your faith plead for a genuine relationship a real Christianity pray that you may know the truth and that the, the type of truth the truth that sets you free because no lie is of the truth but to know freedom to rest in the sovereignty of god this is the child of god's greatest comfort that god causes all things to work together for the good of them that love god that god's hand is present is directing that god is the sovereign ruler of all creation or as jesus put it as thou hast given him power over all flesh that jesus has power over all flesh the wicked and the unjust that he has power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So as many as have been given to the Father, Jesus 
will save them. He said, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me. And with that, we'll pause and turn to John chapter 6. And we'll just begin here in verse 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. So that's just what we were bringing up. They are given to the Father, or they are given by the Father to Jesus Christ. And it says they will come to Christ. It doesn't say they might come. It's possible they come. It says they will come. And it says all, all that the Father gives me shall come. It's incredibly clear. None of them will be lost. They all will come to the Lord. Now we continue. And him that come to me I will in no wise cast out. So all that the Father gives me shall come, and not one of them will be cast out. But all that come will in no wise cast out. I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And we talk about the perseverance of the saints. Jesus came down from heaven to ensure that every single person that has been given to him should not be lost. Every single one, but that they should be raised up again at the last day. That every single one that has been given to Christ will come to Christ, they will be saved, and this is the reason he came from heaven to ensure that every single one of them would not be lost. And to say that Jesus did not fulfill the will of God is to call him a sinner. But that's why he came and that's what he accomplished. And again, he said, This is the Father's will which has sent me. That of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me. That every one which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered, and said to them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So he says, Do not murmur. Don't debate. Don't argue. No man can come to the Father or can come to Jesus unless God Himself directly brings them to Him. No man approaches on His own. No man can come to Jesus, is what Jesus says. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, you that hear the word of God now that hear the testimony of Jesus Christ and you now look into your hands and say the religion that I have held it does not hold to the teaching of Christ and you must abandon it today not tomorrow not time to think you must look into the Word of God the perfect law of liberty which reveals what manner of persons we are and to not be a forgetful hearer to be changed thereby because no true no lie is of the truth it can't be part deception and part true. How can any material good be done by an organization that is entirely and totally rebelled against what Jesus has clearly taught? They are those that will be tread in the wine press. But again, he said, don't murmur among yourselves that no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. So it says that God himself will teach every single one of those who will become saved personally. He personally will teach them. And it confirms this later in 1 John. That he says, 
brethren, you need not that any man should teach you, but the same anointing, it teaches you all things. And it's truth. There's no lie. Even as it has taught you that you shall abide in him. So the anointing itself teaches us that we will persevere by Christ, by the power of Christ. When we receive the Holy Spirit, God himself teaches us the perseverance of the saints. It says that he will teach us all things, that he is our teacher, that we need not submit to man, but we need draw close to Christ and his word and to learn from Christ. Because he teaches every single one of them. He is their teacher. And it's not that we cannot learn from men, but it's important to know the source of all wisdom and knowledge, the source of all doctrine cannot be given to you by man. You must be taught by God himself. And to say, perchance you've never known of this grace, or maybe you're unaware of what we're discussing, then I would suggest that you pray now to Jesus, that you pray now for mercy and for forgiveness, and to reveal this to you, to show you what is the truth. Because there are many times, for example, there was that prophet who went to go and curse the people of God. He went to curse the people of God, and as he was on his way, he was riding on a donkey, on an ass. But the donkey, he saw the angel of the Lord in the path with a sword, ready to slay him. But the man, he didn't see it, and he wanted to continue on, and he was beating the donkey, beating the donkey, and the donkey would not go, would not go at all, because he said there's a giant fierce angelic being with a sword that I'm not going to be cut in half by so he was beating him down and then God answered him by the mouth of the donkey so it's this power this eminent power that sometimes is all around us but yet we do not reach out our hand and perceive him or see him or know him even though he is very near to every one of us at all times he is always very near to us. And yet once the scales are removed from our eyes and we are taught by God and he awakens our spirit, at which point then we see him and we know that he is near and it becomes a tremendous comfort. The fact that God controls all things becomes a tremendous comfort. And many times, even in our own prayers, we ask for God to intercede in the middle of the will of man when we have those who are adversaries against us and we pray for God to change their heart. But yet, we go and we sit and are instructed that God doesn't do any work in anyone's heart, that we need to do it all on our own apart from any grace from God. And by grace, it doesn't just mean mercy for sin or imputed righteousness. By grace, it implies the work of God. And that's what he was saying in 65, that I was sought by them that asked not for me and found by them that sought me not. So he was revealed to those who were not searching for him, those that were not asking for him, unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people. So it's not to a people that is willingly worshiping him that he's stretching out his hand to. He's stretching out his hand to a rebellious people. And unfortunately, those in the greatest sins are most easily prepared to accept that they are a sinner. Those that have grown up and lived religious lives from the time they're young are in a perilous condition because many times they are unwilling to recognize that they are a wicked sinner that deserves the wrath of God and the judgment of God and that they have no material good in their hands at all. That when they look at God, they should fear and set down their eyes immediately due to the gross sin that permeates our life. They've not known the grace of God and they're only outwardly good. And because they're so outwardly good and have the outward intellectual assent to Jesus Christ, and attend the Sunday services. They give up their money. They even volunteer sometimes to go and feed some people. All of this can be done without the Spirit of Christ. 
All of this can be done simply to try to prove to your own heart that you are a Christian. Because when people don't have a real faith, there is a great void in their heart. And that's what leads them to create all of these many other things. If you look in the back of most of the Bibles that people give away for free at this point, what you will find is a list of instructions in the back. Well, actually, you'll find a piece of paper most of the time that says, repeat this and write your name on it and send it to us. And it says, if you've repeated this, what we've written here, you are now a child of God. Your sins are forever paid for. You will never face the wrath of God. Next, follow these steps. And then we'll have another few more steps. Most of the time it says, find a, a good Bible-believing church. Read the Bible daily. If somebody has been born of God, nothing will keep them back from the Bible. Nothing. Nothing will keep them back from the Bible because that is now the voice of their father. And they know him and they follow him, it says. Because, as it is written, he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And he goeth before them. And it says the sheep, they follow him for they know his voice. This is why he says that I've stretched out my hands all the day to a rebellious people which walks in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provokes me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifices in gardens and burns incense upon the altars of brick, which remains among the graves. They lodge in the monuments which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than you. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities... And the iniquities of your fathers, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills, therefore I will measure their former work into their bosom. Thus saith the Lord, As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroyeth it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it. My servants will dwell there, and Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and a valley of Achor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword. You shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. And we must be clear what he means by I. The Lord, who has breathed the scripture, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God or is breathed, is literally God breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness, for reproof, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. That the word of God is to reprove those in error. So if your doctrine, regardless of whatever amount of members are in your church, contradicts the word of God, your doctrine is wrong and you are committing a great sin. This is why he says, let not many become teachers and the importance of studying the word of God as men who deal with a book that is deadly. It is deadly to lie and say, thus saith the Lord when the Lord has not said it. If you want to do good for the people, that you come in contact with, you must learn the scriptures. Because a conversation you have that goes on for hours will mean nothing without the word of God. And it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Or God says, my word is like the rain that goes forth and it waters the earth and it brings forth the, the ear, then the stalk, 
and then the full grain in the ear so it brings forth all of the abundance in salvation it comes through the word of god so if you want to do material good do not study the simple uh little books and instructions about how to follow these five steps or how to become these things i remember when i went to a fair one time and I wanted to preach the Bible to the people going in and out I found a tent of people they said they were Christians and they were Southern Baptists and I asked them for permission to be able to read the Bible near their stands for people that are walking by just to publicly read the Bible no doctrine and what they said was that if you are reading that book near here actually he said we are at 350 today if you read that book near here people will not come into the tent and we can't get them saved. And now, none of those people were being saved by what they were doing. They had a thing where they flipped open little blocks and it showed you, oh, what does this mean? Oh, you're a sinner. Oh, this, if you repeat this prayer, now you're saved. Oh, uh, and then do this. And he, he had thought that he had saved f almost 400 people. And that if they heard the Bible, they would, that would scare them away. They wouldn't be saved because that would make them not come in and do their gospel if they heard the Bible. And now the problem is, because of the blindness of the heart, he does not see the error. That he is actually fighting against God. He's fighting against the Word of God and using an entirely different gospel. There is no five steps in the Bible. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. The reason that they were so furious at him was that they had tons of righteous works and deeds. The Pharisees gave all of their money to the service of the temple. They spent their whole life devoted to obeying the law of God. They devoted themselves to studying and keeping all of the ordinances and commandments. But in the end, it was nothing. Because the law is not to justify us. It's to show us that we are incredibly unjust beings and in need of mercy due to the dreadful and fearful coming judgment of the Lord on sinful souls. Because we naturally are at enmity with God. The carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God. Nor indeed can be. It cannot be subjected. And thus, if we are violators of the law of God, we are criminals. We are sinners. The Bible says sin is a transgression of the law. And you know he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. And we continue on. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God in verse 13, Behold, my servants shall eat but you shall hunger behold my servants shall drink but you shall be thirsty behold my servants shall rejoice but you shall be ashamed behold my servants shall sing for joy of heart but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit and you shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God will slay you. So you will be a curse. You will be hungry. You will be thirsty. While the servants of God will eat and to drink of the body and the blood of Christ. My servants will rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. My servants will sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart and howl. For vexation of spirit and you shall leave your name for a curse to my chosen for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name that he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from my eyes for behold I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered so these formal troubles are forgotten they're hid from my eyes because now he talks about the new heaven and new earth 
So behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. So the old heavens and earth will never be remembered again. It will not come into mind. But the Bible says it will be burned up with fervent heat. That the earth and all its works will be burned up with fervent heat. And the elements being on fire shall be dissolved. And what manner of persons ought you to be, seeing you know these things before? But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create, he says. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, not bring forth for trouble, for they are a seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things have my hands made. All those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. So he's not going to look to your building. Where is the place you will build for him? He's not contained. He is the creator of all things is what he's saying. You cannot contain him or force him to be inside of some sort of structure based on what you call it. Because God is the Lord of all the earth. And he confronts this. That the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you build unto me? Where is the place unto my rest? For all those things have my hand made. My but to this man will I look, he says. Even to him that is of a poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. And so the sound doctrine that we preach unto you, that men should look to themselves and not see any righteousness or good, that men should look only to Christ and his righteousness, is what it means to be of a poor and contrite spirit. To look into your own heart and to not see anything that could recommend you to God, to see the depth of your sin, and to be broken for it, to have godly sorrow, to have a desire to be free from it, and to be made holy by Christ. This is the type of atmosphere that leads men to weep before the Lord. Those that come to Jesus will be saved. Those that seek Jesus for help in time of need will find the greatest gift. The issue is that if you knew what the gift of God was, most people on earth would want nothing to do with it. Because the gift of God is to be delivered from our own evil. The gift of God is to be empowered to live as a Christian all of our days. To have our nature so changed that we now love to perform the will of God. That this is our greatest joy. And the times when we fail, we are filled with a sorrow of heart. This is a radical change. And to the heathen, they would want no desire to live their whole life being chaste and obedient to God. That is not something that sounds to them as a gift because they don't know of the coming judgment of the wicked. They don't know there's no place for them, that the former will not come to mind, and the earth and all its works shall be burned up with fervent heat. 
It says that the Lord Jesus shall come with ten thousands of his saints in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's very well you may religiously attend services, even sometimes read the Bible, but if you do not turn to the true and living God as he demonstrates himself in the word of God, you're not in Christ and you've not come to God. And you prove even further because in your free time you fight against the sovereignty of God. There are people who diligently give all their efforts to fight against the doctrine of God's sovereign grace. And that just proves that there is no free will. Because with all of their strength, all of their effort, all of their study, they cannot bring themselves to even for one moment worship or glorify Christ. They still fight against him tooth and nail, fiercely with everything in their being, proving that they have no power, no efficacy to serve Christ of their own volition. See, the problem is oftentimes when people hear this message, they attack the messenger rather than being of a poor and of a contrite spirit. Rather than looking into the word of God to see if these things are true, and desiring to learn more about what is it that God teaches. To tremble at my word, he says. Now it says that the devils, they believe and they tremble. And he confronts the professors by saying, you believe that there's one God, you do well. But the devils believe and they tremble. But those that are of a poor and a contrite spirit, that is a spirit that has no rest. This is the blessing of the Lord, that if you feel a godly sorrow for your sin, a guilt that is so overwhelming that you cannot put it off unless you just turn to Christ and begin to plead with him, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me. I am a wicked man. If you find this desire arise within you, it is because God is at work in you, because this is not a natural desire at all. Men never come and acknowledge that they have nothing good in them. It is so common that even the most wicked among us will use the statement, I do bad things, but I have a good heart. Because they don't know what good is, or a good heart, or that the chief goal of man is to glorify Christ. And that even many in their religious services are not glorifying Christ. And they're not thankful. And so God gave them over. So here, he that killeth an ox, as if he slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb, as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offers an oblation, as if he that offers swine's blood. He that burneth incense, is he that blessed an idol. Yet they have chosen their own ways. That's right, because no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. So they have chosen their own ways by very nature. And their soul delights in their abominations. So they enjoy, they sing for joy in these abominations. And when those who are the servants of Christ show them the scriptures, show them what God has instructed them to show them, they reject them and they rend them and they trample them under their feet. They do not delight in these people. I love that I read from Flavel the other day a comment where he said, I'm about as sick of this world as it is of me. And that is exactly how the world should treat you if you are faithfully serving Christ. It should be sick of you. It should want itself rid of you. It should either be to the point where they will completely fall to their knees and confess that they are a sinner before Jesus Christ or they will kill you because you can never have any accord with the unbelievers. What fellowship has Christ with Belial? That's what he says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And by yoked, he's regarding pulling the plow as in you shall not plow the field with an ox and an ass yoked together with a clean and an unclean animal, that we must not be joined to do the work of God with unbelievers, meaning those that have not had a genuine conversion and who have not received faith from the Lord. 
and their soul, it delights in their abominations. I will also choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear. But they did evil before mine eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. Hear the word of the Lord, you that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that casted you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. And this is the greatest judgment, that it doesn't matter if they cast you from the churches, if you are among them that tremble at his word, when he appears, it will be to their shame. It won't matter if they join hand in hand. If there's 10,000 members of that congregation, to this one will I look, he says. To him that is of a poor and a contrite spirit and that trembles at my word. And you that tremble, he says. And regarding your brethren that hated you and cast you out for my name's sake, he shall appear to your joy, a voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that renders repayment to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Rejoice ye for Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you that love her. Rejoice for her with her, all you that mourn for her that you may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolation, that you may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then shall they suck, then shall ye suck, and ye shall be borne upon her sides and be dandled upon her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And this again, when he says he looked and he saw coming down from heaven as it were a bride adorned for her groom, new Jerusalem. And it says that this is the mother of us all, meaning those that are in Christ, their mother is Jerusalem. And here he's talking about that as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And so he's talking about this consummation, the end of the world. That's when the vision of peace and restoration after the desolation takes place. And when you shall see this, your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like an herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants and his indignation toward his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. And so now, again, the consummation of all things at this time when the people of God will be comforted, when they will rejoice forever in the new heaven and in the new earth, and when the Lord comes with fire and in anger and his rebuke against the people of the world against all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many it says they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst and we do know that is the tree of life eating swine's flesh and the abomination the mouse shall be consumed together saith the Lord for I know their works and their thoughts it shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape from them onto the nations. I will send those that escape from them onto the nations. 
to Tarshish, Pul, and Lud that draw the bow, to Tubal, Javan, to the isles afar off. They've not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters, upon mules and upon swift beasts, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord. As the children of Israel bring me an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. It shall come to pass from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against me. And that's what the Lord commands. Obey my voice. So to put off all corruptions or deceits and to embrace the doctrine of Christ, the sincere milk of the word, and to search out the scriptures and to seek God for wisdom and to pray for him to be our teacher. Because if we do not immerse ourselves in the word of God, we are utterly hopeless to stand against the great volume of false prophets. Right now, we live in a time of great falling away, and it would almost seem as if one out of every ten people who claim to be a Christian are actually converted, maybe even less. It's a time of spreading abominations and where the false Christianity, which has been brought in, and only a few short years ago, we were explaining that this was entering into the churches. But now, the new spirit and the new uh, Jesus showing signs and wonders for all of them is now the dominant strain. It has become Christianity, and Christianity has been cast away. But upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So they will be remembered eternally. Those that do not look to God, those that make and worship a God that is made with the hands of men, meaning not the God of the Bible. Even if his name is called Jesus, if he is not the Jesus of the Bible, you are counted in this number that will be scattered. Thank you, Lord. Give us grace and wisdom and understanding. I thank you for this great promise of a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells, of a time of restoration where the sufferings and rejection of this present time will be no more, and we will be known and embraced, and that we will spend eternity rejoicing and worshiping God. In Jesus' name, amen.